So this morning's teaching is gonna kind of help us just evaluate. Help us just find some of those edges that we can buff and soften and buffer and smooth out. And again, nothing I share with you, I want you to use, and again, this is my intention because I can't control what you do with what I say. Right? The game I play with the world and my teachings is I try to concoct a teaching that is impossible for your ego to use as a weapon against you. And then slowly over time, I watch ego use it as a weapon, and then I create more. And this is the game I play. So my intention is, I want to give you some very clarifying teachings today. But my intention, my invitation is, let's use this to shine the light of awareness Let's use this to see where we can grow. But please, my deepest intention is let us not use this against ourselves. We don't have to feel bad. We can just become better. For me in my life, that was always an inherent philosophy of, I don't have to feel bad about anything that I've done. I can just, in the next moment, try again. I just try again. And I just try to do better. And in my life, there are certain things that I've done really well, there are certain things I've learned to do better, and there are certain things I had to do a thousand times before I perfected it. And I never stopped until I got it right. So this morning's teaching, <laughs> which may elicit the oohs and ahs, <laughs> is one by one, looking at the let's call them four factors. The four factors that help you determine how unconscious or conscious you are. Mm. <laughs> four factors. And they came to me, bless you, they came to me this morning. The four factors of how conscious or unconscious you are. And again, no labels, no need to, but just to go, oh, I, that might be where I should grow. <laughs> and I'll do them one at a time. So we can all, you know, for those of us to take notes. Because here's the thing, if we don't define the factors that define unconsciousness or consciousness, as sensitive beings, you, you basically walk around assuming you're unconscious. Like yesterday when I talked about the dream or the illusion. You assume you're in one. Or we talked about it being the dream of blame, unconsciousness. So these four factors will determine how deeply you're in the dream of blame or how far away from the dream of blame you become. And for a lot of us, we're going to go, wow, I've grown a lot. And that's my hope is for you to say that. And if there are points where you go, and that's a growing edge for me, that's good too. We're here to learn how to feel good about the work we've already done, and we're here to learn what work remains. Because we're here to do the work. And we're here to enjoy the work, and not be intimidated by the work, and not to rush through the work. Mastery is not how much work you've done, but how honorably you do the work at hand. So my intention is to teach you and escort you through doing work honorably. Right? Not like you have homework and you flip to the back of the book and you write all the answers down and I'm done. <laughs> but actually doing the work. So factor number one to help us determine how unconscious We may be. Now, when I talk about this, it not only will help you understand how conscious or unconscious you might be, but also help you understand where other people in your life might be, partner, family, friends, whatever. Because if you could understand someone's state of consciousness, it doesn't hurt so bad when they act the way they act. So this is not just for you, it's about understanding relationships. The emotional journey is about understanding relationships. So let's just deconstruct this. Factor number one. <laughs> Unconsciousness begins with asking yourself this one hilarious question. How quickly 
or easily do you become agitated? Because what I have noticed is that I have worked with beings at a variety of levels of consciousness, beings that have woken up on certain levels, but not worked through their emotional density on another level. And especially when you wake up out of identity and you think, oh, I'm not the body. You try to disown the emotional density that is your course of mastery. And when you have disowned your emotional density and you are in some sort of state of presence, that's not liberation, that's actually a state of disassociation. And what's amazing is that the qualities of awakened consciousness and the descriptions of disassociation are like next door neighbors. They're very close. And what I've seen, and I'm saying this as just an offering, an observation, that I've seen beings with very sacred Sanskrit names, <laughs> dressed to the nines in the holiest of holies garb, mala beads like they're the Mr. T of spirituality. <laughs> an entire crystal store on their being. <laughs> and what I watch is the speed at which they go from zero to agitation. That's where the wolf exposes itself in sheep's clothing. How quickly or easily do you become agitated? It's hard not to make awakened consciousness an aspiration, because I speak to you from experience. I've had a lot of healing over the last six months, and it's made me more bulletproof than I already was, and I become more and more, and you get to a certain space, and I'm just speaking from experience. And it's hard when I say this not to like salivate and want this but there's a certain point where you become completely immovable, where you cannot be disrupted by life. And you're not in a defensive state. You're in a completely surrendered state. You're too close to life for life to even touch you. There's too much understanding for anyone to disrupt you. It's not like you learn how to not be agitated you actually forget what it is to be agitated. You forget what it's like to be disrupted by someone else's subjective experience. Someone has a problem with you, it's actually curious. You, got, you kind of get interested, like they're talking about someone else. <laughs> like if someone had a problem with me, I'd love to hear more about that. A couple years ago, when we were getting this started, Julie called me one day and said, Matt, there's someone on YouTube who is blasting you in the comment section. And I said, can you ask him to sh elaborate on that? <laughs> I'd love to know more. Imagine someone's problem with you being interesting to you. Hmm, I'd love to hear more about that. How quickly or easily do you get agitated? Or in human terms, how easily or effortlessly do you flip the fuck out? <laughs> You're on an elevator and it stops and the doors don't open immediately. <laughs> ah, oh no. It's even more amazing when you see a spiritual ego, which I have also called a spiritual narcissist, who has learned some degree of mindfulness. I saw this at uh, an event I was at one time before I started teaching, and, it, and, it, and it, I didn't know what I was seeing, and it, it amazed me. And I was seeing a spiritual narcissist 
who had learned about mindfulness. And what this means is that the person is pointing out other people's lack of mindfulness in an unmindful way. <laughs> so there was a line of people leaving the sanctuary because I was at someone else's retreat. I was at a chanting retreat. And the one person was talking to someone else and the line wasn't moving to this person's desired rate of speed. And mindful spiritual narcissist said, do you mind there's other people here? <laughs> While not being mindful of someone else's experience. How amazing that can be, how can that can be missed? I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I might, I might have to go for it. Thank you. But see, now the stage fright, so he went away. Okay. So how quickly or easily do you get agitated? Let's just even make it more true to you right now. And again, it's not a judgment. It's just an evaluation. Just for one moment, think about the character in your current life. Who agitates you? Who gets you? <laughs> In other words, name your Antichrist. <laughs> Who gets you? And whoever that is, visualize their face in your heart and you know what you say to them? Thank you. Thank you for helping me move further out of unconsciousness, away from blame, turning my problem back into a process. Thank you. Thank you for being ruthlessly ridiculous. Right? Who's the one person who doesn't play by any rule you subscribe to? Who turns your spiritual reality into a free-for-all? Who gets you? Who's that one person where for whatever reason or maybe from your past and just, you know, you could be listening to David Pramal, light some candles, Maybe, you know, maybe some incense, you know, do some of your spiritual stretches, this too shall pass, <laughs> so it is, and so forth. I am that I am. And then there's that person that comes along and you're just like, oh, damn it. <laughs> that fucking person right there. That person right there. All right, so here's the deal. I don't get agitated, but I'll tell you, I'll just be honest. Here's as close as I get to being agitated. I'm just gonna be honest about it. I'm not afraid. When you're, when you're awake, being a person and saying these things is a joy because you know yourself. I don't get agitated, but you know what I have? I have one or two pet peeves. <laughs> I do. And you know what? You know what I think about my pet peeves? They're fucking delicious. And when someone does this, it doesn't get me mad. It makes me laugh. That's as far as it goes now. I have a pet peeve because I'm an individual, divine in an individual form, and I'm allowed to have a pet peeve. <laughs> I'll tell you what else I'm allowed to have. You know what I'm allowed to have? I'm allowed to have one fear. One childhood fear that's still there. I'm in a state of samadhi. All is one. I am that I am. And if a bee buzzes by me, I'm going to do the flash dance. <laughs> Do you know why? Because it might get me. <laughs> People go, but Matt, nothing can touch consciousness. Yeah, well, bees have stingers. <laughs> so what's... I don't know how many pet peeves I have, to be honest. I don't think I have many. I know I have one specific one. And it's just one of those things where you go, hmm... Right? <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> it almost, like when you're unconscious, it burns, but when you're conscious, it just kind of tickles your stomach a little bit. <laughs> and, and, and I was reminded of that peeve because it actually happened at the hotel last night. And it's just the littlest thing that makes you go. <laughs> so, you ever been on an elevator? 
and you're going to get off the elevator. Now, there's people that are going to get on the elevator, but they're trying to get on the elevator before you get off. I fucking hate that. You know, even, you know what's even worse? They're trying to get on. They're not letting you off because they want to get on. And as they're turning to scooch by you, they say, excuse me. <laughs> oh, am I in your way? Sorry, I have the right of way. You have the yield position. I was here first. I get off because I have arrived to the floor. You were already on. So let me off. And then you have all this space to enter. And even if they get on first, they can't go down until I get off. What's the advantage? What time are you saving? It doesn't agitate me. It just makes me kind of... Just, what? All right, you know what my other pet peeve is? <laughs> Why not, right? Laughter helps us to loosen the emotions that need to be healed. <sighs> my second pet peeve, and this is something that I just philosophically do not resonate with. One day, I went to the grocery store. And I saw that I could either stand in line to be checked out or I could do this thing called self-check. <laughs> where I would take on the role of someone that works at a grocery store. And I could look up the codes of my vegetables and I can do it all myself. I don't like that. <laughs> I will stand in line and wait for someone to check me out for 25 minutes. And there could be no one in line for self-check. I will not do that. <laughs> I despise that. It's funny. It's funny. It's a little quirk. You know what I mean? It's okay to have quirks. You can have quirks. Be a human being. Doesn't have to agitate you. <laughs> I say this to give you the space to be who you are. Is there, any, is there anything that, that agitates you? What is able to agitate you? Who agitates you? And whoever agitates you, whatever agitates you, and I've said thank you to self-check many times <laughs> while rejecting it totally. I would rather risk my frozen foods defrosting in line <laughs> and drive across traffic at lightning speed to get it in my freezer than do that. I did self-check once, and it was as bad as I thought. I, I scanned the things, and the system guy says, wait for assistance. Why, why should I be in line? And she goes, is there a problem? I said, yes, there's a problem. She goes, what? I said, the problem is I don't work here. <laughs> I don't know how any of this works. She goes, we have to look up the code. I go, do you know why you know that? Because you've been trained. <laughs> Ma'am, do I invite you on my stage to lead a meditation? No, I don't. Why are you asking me to do this? I don't know how to do it. <laughs> so funny. Standing in line at the grocery store with my beautiful wife. She goes, oh, honey, do you want to do self-check? Sure don't. <laughs> sure don't, honey. I'm going to stand right here. Rather stand and do a meditation. <laughs> so
So factor number one, how quickly or easily do you get agitated? That's the first way of checking unconsciousness. Factor number two, how genuinely do you receive compliments? Mm. When a compliment comes your way, do you allow yourself to receive it graciously or do you swat it like a flies in your face? <laughs> There's nothing stranger than secretly wanting people to see you and then politely rejecting the feedback they give you. Oh, you look nice today. <laughs> Usually when we reject a compliment, it's not even a word, it's just a sound. <laughs> It's usually, and the sound basically means I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> I'm waiting for my starring role, but I don't handle the spotlight when it comes so unexpectedly. I talked yesterday about how I used to do that, secretly want to be seen, and then say people would give me the feedback, and then I do the whole spiritual mumbo jumbo, oh, you know, we're all one. I'm just reflecting your light back to you, which sounds awesome but how it was used in my reality was ridiculous. Because what happens is when you receive a compliment, the light of a compliment is like a spiritual missile deconstructing and dissolving all the barriers that you yield to shield your heart from life. So a compliment is trying to destroy your hiding spot and bring you out of hiding. So we want the compliment, but we don't want it to destroy our secret base. <laughs> our hidden lair. It's like we want to be in our secret underground bunker. We want someone to put a Valentine card down by there. We want to be able to come out of the hole, get it, <laughs> and go back down and read it in secrecy. But when a compliment comes your way, you don't get that luxury. A compliment is a missile coming to destroy that underground bunker. It's someone going, hey, you're beautiful and amazing and worthwhile. And you're like, oh my God, I'm totally not ready for this. You're never ready for it. You're never ready for it. Here's a really interesting insight to always keep in mind. You're never ready for the words that matter most to your heart. You're never ready, never ready. You can wake up early, take a run around the block, do some stretches, get ready. Oh my, my baby's gonna wake up in a few minutes and I'm ready for this. You're never ready for the words that matter most to your heart because we have to learn how to take it. A lot of us know how to give it, we don't know how to take it. We don't know how to be seen. Makes us feel wiggly. And if you don't know how to be seen, someone's compliment to you will actually feel like work or feel exhausting or actually might even feel draining to you, like, oh, too much. I don't know how to take all of that in. It doesn't match the things I say about myself to myself because a compliment is the light of consciousness actually trying to open your eyes to who you really are by destroying the barriers and shields you use to divide yourself with life. A compliment, just like any form of intimacy, is an opportunity to be liberated by being destroyed by love. Let love destroy your barriers. Let love pull you out of hiding by obliterating the things you're hiding behind. A compliment is an assassination attempt to the inferior ego structure. To the ego, the complimenter feels like an assassin. <laughs> so 
sometimes it's not even just a compliment that we don't know how to take. We don't know how to take eye contact. On the spiritual path, one of a very popular practice is eye gazing. And it's a beautiful thing where we connect our lights together. But sometimes what happens is the eye gazing is a way of actually checking out of the personal connection. Like we look, we trance out, and we've checked out. Because you don't know actually how to be on the receiving end of someone's gaze to be seen for that amount of time without feeling like, okay, that's enough, that's uncomfortable. Because eye contact and compliments is an assassination attempt on the inferior ego. It's a gift for the soul and it's panic and it's concern and it's worrisome for the part of you that's not gonna make the journey that's holding on for dear life. So factor number two, how, how genuinely do you receive compliments? Because it's, it's kind of weird to think that sometimes it's easier to give compliments than it is to receive compliments. And the reason it is is because we've been taught in our families, whether directly or indirectly, that love is something we have to earn. So we learn how to give because we're trying to receive, we're trying to earn something back. But it's kind of like a little kid who run towards the ocean and when the ocean actually starts to come back, the child runs away. Yeah. Like, hey, I want to know the ocean. And the ocean goes, oh yeah? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> That's when we play with our loved ones. Ooh, I want to know you. I want to, ooh, look at the ocean. Ooh, give me some of that. Really? Okay, no, <laughs> We seek love and then run away from the, the love that we've sought. You ever had that experience? Maybe in yourself or others? You run towards love. Here's the one. Oh, shit, I got to receive that. See you later. <laughs> Sooner or later, the ocean gets you. One of those attempts to turn around and the the little child trips on the sand and is soaked by the water and swept into the current of truth. No one inherently has a fear of intimacy. Fears of intimacy is what always exists when the ego is letting go of its last grip. Everyone goes through the fear of intimacy, everyone. Because fear of intimacy is when you know you are in the presence of the one you can be loved and truly love, to be loved by and love. And that ego says, this is gonna destroy me. And if you're insightful, you'll allow it you'll allow your beloved to be your assassin. That's what I did. I allowed my beloved to be my assassin. And I'm better because of it. Thank you. In the fear of intimacy, which is the ego's last stand, the ego is afraid of losing its identity of object consciousness and is afraid of merging with another. But when love is present, both individuals lose themselves in the same meeting point, which is the merging of unity consciousness. It doesn't mean you live without an identity. It doesn't mean you live without an awareness of your personal needs. It means in the presence of the one that you can truly be loved by, you will feel like you're getting sucked out of yourself and into them. And to resist that 
is the fear of intimacy that keeps an ego structure alive. And when you can let go and totally lose yourself in another and they lose themselves in you, here's the interesting thing that happens. Both people get sucked out of themselves and meet in the point of oneness. As soon as that connection happens, they both are brought back to their individual structures to be individuals, to hold space for themselves, and also being able to be connected as one with each other simultaneously. So it's actually an initiation. When the initiation is happening, you are being pulled out of yourself and you are losing yourself. You feel like you're being flushed down the toilet of the universe <laughs> and you have no idea where you're going. You're being sucked into the heart of your beloved and your beloved's being sucked into your heart. And it feels like you're dying. It feels like you're losing your grip on reality. And as soon as that moment of connection happens, the circle's complete. And then the two that are one, then are individual aspects of the same one. And they can have their individual needs, but they can actually dance and harmonize together. They can be individuals, they can be one, and it's no longer this back and forth of, I'm in my individual reality, and I'm sharing space with another. Oh, that's too much time, I gotta then hide and recharge, and it's not this dance. And whether you're in a relationship or not, that meeting of you being pulled out of yourself and connecting with reality, truth, is you becoming one with present moment reality. And then it's no longer, I'm in present moment reality. Oh my God, I've been in that for too long. I gotta go hide and be in, 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 in an isolated space. And it's not this back and forth. So whether you're in a relationship or not, it's the same metaphor. Does that make sense? And I say this because years ago, I got sucked out of myself. I got pulled out of myself and I, I was pulled into the light of truth. And it was like plunging into a black hole. And I plunged deep into nothingness until nothing was there. It was such nothingness that not even anyone was falling anymore. And all of a sudden, out of nothing, the light emerged. And that was the moment of communion. And then I was put right back in my individual structure where I was able to connect and connect with the oneness within all beings, whether they could meet me there or not but I had to get pulled out of myself to be returned to myself. I had to take the wave out just to see that the wave would change its current and take me back into the shore. So if you get sucked out of yourself and into the heart of your beloved or into the heart of the present moment, if you allow it, the current that pulls you out will bring you back better and reborn. There's a difference between what I'm describing and making other people's needs more important than yours. That's different. The unhealthy losing yourself is when you are serving someone else's needs by disregarding your needs. That's what I did most of my life. Because I wasn't trained how to pay attention to my needs. Because I was an empath and I was too preoccupied with other people's feelings. And because I could feel their feelings, all I knew is if I could change how they felt, it would change how I felt. And I was living in a reality of vibrational codependency. And so I had to learn how to make my feelings matter. And to articulate those feelings in a way where I wasn't worried about the people I was sharing it with and whether it would cause them to leave me or abandon me. I had to face my own feelings of abandonment that I didn't even know were there. Factor number one, how quickly or easily can you become agitated? Factor number two, how genuinely do you receive compliments? Factor number three, how generously do you give to those you love? 
Because when you've merged with the light of consciousness, you can give to those you love in a way that doesn't exhaust you. You can actually be replenished by the vibration of your generosity. And just by receiving the opportunity to give to someone you love, you can be filled up no matter how what you give is received. So if factor number three on how conscious or unconscious we are is how openly we give to those we love, let's talk about what it means to give. What are the aspects that go into giving? And I'm gonna talk about a very interesting word. You know, in the spiritual journey, people talk about being present. That's a lovely word. But at this point, it kind of becomes a very overstated buzzword. We have to de deconstruct or unpack it. There's what I think is an even more poignant word that is the activity of presence. Not are you present or not, because often if you're asking yourself that question, you're in your head and you're not in the present moment. So what's the activity of presence? It's one delicious, clarifying word. It's called interest. Interest. If, you want, if you're in a relationship, and the relationship, like I said, is family, friends, or beloveds, neighbors, coworkers, whatever, you decide where the light needs to go. But if the question is, how present are you with your relationships? Here's the question. How interested are you in the experiences of those people? Are you only interested in the subject matters that personally interest you? Or whether they're interested in something that doesn't quite jive with you, are you interested in watching someone you love express what they're passionate about? How interested are you in being a part of another person's passion? How delicious of a question is that? How interested are you in being a part of another person's passion? And how many of us want people to ask us questions to take a greater interest in us? Are we the people that take a greater interest in those we yearn to be validated by? And one of the things that makes it so difficult is God forbid you have people in your family that are not quite as hopped up on the spiritual path as you are. And if the spiritual path is an extension of your ego structure, you will think the people that don't take an interest in my spiritual path must not be interested in me. The people that are not interested in your spiritual path have the potential to be interested in your personal life. And if your spiritual path is a replacement for your personal life, that imbalance will make you think someone doesn't care about you. So I say, have spiritual aspirations, have personal interests to give everyone an equal opportunity to share in your passion. On a personal level, I enjoy cooking. I watch the Food Network. I love music, documentaries, professional wrestling, and UFC. <laughs> and someone who may not give a crap about my spiritual path and my offerings to this planet can talk to me about so many other things. And I am someone who naturally is interested in whatever people are passionate about. And if it's something I know the least about, the more interested I become. When you are an awake being, you are thankful that you have people in your life to whom you can be interested in their passions. They are the ocean 
and you are the observer and you are thankful that you have the opportunity to ride waves of passion in their world of interest. And when two come together in sacred communion, they don't have to be similar on any level, but only have the common interests of being mutually interested in sharing in the passions of the one they love. And so many times, I remember I had a dialogue once and I was talking with a woman who was married to a man who didn't have a spiritual aspiration bone in his body. And her complaint was, he never asks me about my meditation. And I asked her a funny question. I said, did you ask him who won the game? She says, oh, I'm not into that. (laughs) Well, in his mind, you're not into him. Just like in her mind, him not asking about the meditation means he's not into her. If you're an awake being, you don't let the fact that you may not give a shit about a subject matter to keep you from being interested in someone's passion. You don't care about organized sports? Besides the point. Someone you love is. Honey, who won? What was your favorite play? What was the best moment of the game? Even if you're with someone who is happy when a rival loses, And that makes you feel like that is the most unconscious thing in the world. (laughs) Honey, did the enemies lose? (laughs) How many players did we injure? (laughs) But honey, did we injure them to the degree where they're unable to even work in, in the NFL ever again? I'm joking, but you see what I'm saying? You actually step into someone else's world and say, I'd like to be a part of your passion. You don't have to be passionate about what they're passionate about. You just have to say, I want to be a part of your passion. Because one of the tenets of consciousness is answering the question, how openly do you give to those you love? Now, if you are firing on all cylinders, the question becomes, how openly do you give, period? But the problem with that question is that most of us who are spiritually waking up but still have a lot of emotional density work too hard to be all things to all people. So I don't want you right now on day two to look any further than the people that matter most to you. Master this with people who matter most and then we'll broaden it over time. Does that make sense? Right? A lot of us go, I'm going to be unconditionally loving to every single human being in existence. Well, let's just pump the brakes on that a little bit. Right? There's a play called life. We all get to decide which character we're going to play. And the overzealous spiritual being goes, hmm, I can be anyone. I know. I'm going to be Jesus Christ. I'm going to be Mother Teresa. How about just fully present with your partner? Can we start there? Maybe step number one isn't the liberator of all beings. Maybe just a deeper interest in your partner's I don't mean to put her on the spot, but you know one of the things I love about my wife? Count on myself, I'm so sorry. So one of the things I love to watch is UFC or professional wrestling. And one of the things my wife likes to do in her own downtime is read a book on a Kindle. And when I'm watching wrestling, and she comes down and joins me and we talk about the wrestling for a second, but she's just reading her book and she just wants to be in the same space with me. That blasts my heart open. Aww. 
means the world to me. That for me is a moment of intimacy. That we get to enjoy ourselves together. Thank you. How openly do you give to those you love? And that doesn't mean that you don't have the right to have your own personal downtime. You should. You should have your own personal downtime. I'm just saying when it's time to be with your partner or your family or people that you choose to be around, right? I'm not saying the family you think you have to be around or the family you feel guilty if you're not around them, right? A few of that going on. I'm defining your inner circle. Let's, let's create a phrase, inner circle. Inner circle are the people you want to be around. The people you want to be around. I'm not saying have no downtime and always be in their field. I'm not saying that. I'm saying when it's time to be around the people you want to be around, how openly do you give? And what are we giving? The gift of interest. That's what presence is, interest. What is a short attention span? I don't know how to be interested for long periods of time. Most people in the world don't know how to be interested in others for longer periods of time, and they go back to their own self-interest. They step out for a second, oh my God, nothing you're saying is feeding me, (laughs) bye-bye. You ever had a conversation, someone asks you a question, and you start to talk, and they go, oh my God, that reminds me of something else, back to you. Back to you, that's so cool. A short attention span means I have been trained to be more interested in my own self-interest and don't know how to be equally interested in others. Presence is when we are equally interested in ourselves as we are in others. That's balance. And even when your partner has something to share with you and you're not quite in that space, presence will say, you can say to your partner, honey, I would love to hear everything you have to say. I'm not quite in that space. Can we talk about this later? Do you know what we call that? Something I never had as a child. I was never given this. It's called a boundary. I was never given a boundary. And I was trained by my parents, God bless them, mostly my mother, God rest her soul, that to be loved is to be smothered. I was never given boundaries. So I never knew the benefit of that. I never knew how to stop and go, am I actually in a space where I'm the most ready, willing, and able to receive what someone needs to share with me? I never gave, I never gave myself the right to consider that. It was always, someone needs me. My feelings don't matter. So when we're in a really conscious relationship, you're able to have time for yourself, and when it's time to be with your partner, you can totally be together. They're interested in you, you're interested in them for the time you are dedicating to one another. You both have time to do your own thing and you have time to come together, merge together, and to lose yourself in a moment that will only return you back to yourself more whole and aligned than ever before. And in awakening, we're developing this primal trust, the trust the ego doesn't have, which is if you get sucked out of yourself into someone's heart, you're gonna be returned back to yourself better than ever before. And you learn to get pulled out of yourself and brought right back. Can you trust that? A lot of people can't. Which is why they step out of themselves, take a little bit of interest, and in the middle of the the, the moment someone else's interest starts to pull them into the light, they go, ooh, too much. And that's not, that's not a judgment. That's, that's something we all go through in what's called the ego's last stand. So factor number three, how openly do you give to those you love? Factor number four. And I say it slowly because I'm trying to remember it. <laughs> Factor number four, how deeply do you respect the space of someone else's process? 
When people are in emotional process, when people are growing, they need space to be with themselves. It's one thing to say, I can hold space for someone, but what happens when someone says, well, in order for me to really be where I need to be, I need to only be in a space with myself. It's one thing to say, I can be with you, honey, through anything. And then your honey says, well, what I need from you is to be here while I'm over there. How deeply do you respect the space of someone else's process? This is something that I had to learn in the latter years of my life because I was never given, my space was never respected in my earlier years. My mom, God bless her soul, and again, when she passed, and from the majority of my adult life at the latter years of my mom's life where we were on the best of terms, I actually became the spiritual teacher to both my parents. My parents were lovely people, just conditioned, and I was just as much of a victim of their ego as they were. No malice, I helped them both leave their body and they're doing great. Talk to them in the afterlife all the time. I do. They, my mom even said to me uh, four days ago, she came to me when I was walking through a mall, and she said, you know, thank you for everything that you put up with and everything that we learned in the afterlife. Your father and I have both learned what we didn't see back then. And my mom said to me, Never feel bad about sharing on stage what happened because when you talk about what you've learned and grown from and other people benefit, it gives our souls greater purpose for the roles we played. So I was never given space as a kid. My mom played a game with me and, it play, and she was playing, this is a game her, her father played with her. And the game was, I'm gonna do everything for you and go above and beyond and the moment I need something, you don't have a choice. And I'm gonna throw it in your face and you're gonna feel bad, I'm gonna break you down so you give me what I want. I never had space. I just learned to get comfortable burning in the fire of no space. I learned to be the space within no space. And that is really, really a great talent until you get into a really functional relationship. So I had to learn real quickly. I had to learn what a boundary was. And I had to learn that someone else's boundary doesn't mean it's taking away from me. I had to learn that someone else taking space for themselves doesn't mean I'm being abandoned or that I'm not good enough. That's what I had to learn. Because factor number three says, oh, how openly do you give to, to the people you love, right? How openly do you give? The balance of that is how deeply do you respect the space of someone else's process? Give, 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 and then someone says, okay, that's enough. Okay, can you shift gears? Like I said yesterday, sometimes your presence is the gift someone needs, and sometimes the greatest gift you can give someone is your momentary or permanent absence. How deeply do you respect the space of someone else's process? How deeply do you respect the space of your own personal process, meaning sometimes mentally you want to be around the person you love, but what you actually need is just space to be by yourself, and then that brings up feelings of loneliness in the ego and feelings of boredom, and you're not actually taking the space you need because you can't imagine being without the person you think you can't live without. Are you giving yourself the chance to respect the space of your process? And if not, your process is gonna turn you into someone who is constantly triggered by your partner or you constantly triggering your partner. Because triggering partners means someone's not taking the space they need. Why does my partner trigger me? Because someone's not taking space. The person that gets triggered is the one who's not taking the right space for themselves. That's what a trigger teaches you. The person that triggers you is triggering you in a moment where you need space to yourself and you're not taking it. You're too busy trying to be all things to all people. (coughs) 
How quickly or easily do you get agitated? How genuinely do you receive compliments? How openly do you give to those you love? How deeply do you respect the space of someone else's process? Just by talking about it, you feel more consciousness arising within you. And the heat you feel is the unconsciousness being burned away. And it's being melted out of you at, right, at, at, at lightning speed because we're talking and exposing it in the light of consciousness. So then what's the bridge? What's the bridge that takes any degree of unconsciousness into consciousness? Self-love. Self-love. Which no matter what new teachings I channel and bring to you at this event and future events beyond, which I always bring new teachings, as you know, the cornerstone will always be weaving in the importance of self-love. So as a way of helping to further melt away any degree of unconsciousness and to strengthen and reinforce and enhance any degree of consciousness within you, I would like to share with you a different nuance and way of approaching self-love. I talked about the ease in which you become agitated is a sign of unconsciousness. So what is the very remedy for agitation? And in order to know that, we have to know what agitation is trying to tell us. Agitation arises as a form of inner conflict within the body of one who desperately wants to be seen and validated and valued by others, but is not taking the time to validate and value themselves. I can certainly fucking try. <laughs> Don't know why I said it like that, but it was fun. <laughs> Agitation is a form of inner conflict arising in someone who yearns to be valued and validated by others who is not valuing and validating themselves. That's what agitation means. So let's talk about how to see ourselves. To see ourselves is to recognize our own inner beauty. Our own inner beauty, which is also called our worth, is how the truth of our soul's light sees its own radiance. When you see worth in you, when you see beauty in you, you are the light of truth being charmed by your own radiance. Have you ever taken the time to acknowledge how beautiful you are? Because over the last six months, something that happened to me unexpectedly, not that it never was true before, it just deepened in a way I never imagined. I had a moment where I, and again, this is not in a narcissistic way, this is in a very soulful way. Because remember, I'm coming from divine reality and being a human being is for me a completion and a gift and a joy. And I came into this moment where the light in myself recognized itself as it truly is with no distortions, with no limitations. And a moment like this is literally like an accomplishment in your life's journey where when you accomplish this one thing, it's as rare as seeing a comet in the sky that only comes around every 10,000 years. And it is the spontaneous experience of seeing yourself as you really truly are in all your brilliance, in all your magnificence, in all your glory, in all of your perfection. And I had a moment where I was taking a walk in my neighborhood and I spontaneously, without trying, just it happened and I just stepped outside of myself and I saw myself as the light that people have been seeing me as for so many years. And I saw myself directly in a flash and even if this flash lasts for half of a millisecond, 
the potency of you seeing yourself directly for half of a millisecond has the instantaneous power to transform and change every single cell in your body on contact. And in one fell swoop out of nowhere, I was overwhelmed with this sensation of having unexpectedly fallen completely in love with who I am. And that's when I became whole. And I thought I was whole for many years, and on certain levels I was. And I didn't realize that there were so many other levels and horizons for me to discover. And now what I really know it is to be whole, to be relaxed, to be complete, to not make other people's experiences about me. To not take other people's stories and make it into a disempowering story about this one. I fell madly and completely in love with who I am. And it left me with this sensation of waking up each morning. For many years, I've been feeling like, not even past 13 years, 20 years, like knowing where my life was gonna go and having a vision of, oh, when I get there. So, so this caused me to no longer feel like when I get there, feeling like now I'm here, which is weird. You've been spending years going, when I get there, and now you're here. And instead of all day saying to yourself, I'm gonna get there or I'm getting there, instead you say to yourself, I can't believe I'm here. And I woke up every morning, and I, this has happened gradually and then profoundly over the last six months. Every single day I wake up and I have the greatest fortune that I get to be me. With this sensation in the depths of my gut that says, if after this incarnation there are future lifetimes, I'm coming back as Matt Kahn. I wake up each morning privileged to be myself, charmed by being me, grateful for the gifts I get to give to those I love and those I don't even know, because that's the level I play at. Sometimes the gift is attention, and sometimes the gift is space. All the while, I'm having the time of my life being me. And I've always had a drive to grow spiritually, and I've always enjoyed certain aspects of life, but I never truly got to the 100% place of being totally content with being myself. And now I am, which is why I'm teaching this today to you. Can you open up in this moment and allow yourself to turn towards the recognition of your inner beauty? Can you allow the inner smile to arise? That is just you being charmed and amused with the mystery of you. And all of your innocence and all of your uniqueness and all of your quirkiness and craziness, can you get lost and bewildered by the beauty of you? Like a work of art in a museum that captures your attention and you stop and you just can't look away, can you be sucked into the single pointed focus of your own beauty. Because if you cannot give attention to your beauty for an extended period of time, it would be no surprise why you walk around a world where people look past you. Can you see you? Don't ask the question, who am I? Just look directly inward and find beauty. 
find grace, find perfection, find innocence. And then we extend it to our experiences. Can you find beauty in the vulnerability of your experiences? You may not like how it feels to be sad, but if you look deep enough, you'll be surprised to find that in the depths of sadness, it can suddenly become beautiful. Have you ever had that experience of finding complete beauty in sadness, the bitter sweetness of God, I hate how I feel, but I'm almost, I'm also intrigued and grateful that I have the capacity to feel this deeply. Have you ever been so devastated where on one level, everything in your life has turned upside down and on some weird level, you feel like you've never lived like you're living right now? You ever had that feeling? I'm living. I'm living. I'm doing it. I'm on a journey. I have been smashed to pieces and nothing makes sense, but God damn it, I feel alive. <laughs> you ever read that? That's incredible. Now, you don't always need to be smashed apart to get there, but that's, all, that's oftentimes what turns the key in the ignition. It gets the motor going. There's beauty in your sadness if you look deep enough. There's beauty in your physical body if you look directly at it. There's beauty in a diagnosis if you take it deep enough. There's beauty in despair if you can tune into the innocence. There's a sweetness in fear. The sweetness in fear is there's an innocence in you that just wants to be told that everything's gonna be okay. Whether or not you know the okay that's coming your way or not. There is beauty in tragedy and never for those that are in the tragedy, but only when it happens to you. Because you see the opportunity of growth at hand. And whether you can see that or not, there is a beauty in tragedy. There is a beauty in loss. Sometimes you don't know how to be so grateful for the gifts you've been given until they're gone. And you might think, how come I couldn't be this grateful when I had it? Because sometimes you can't tap that deeply in until something's taken from you. That's just the, that's just the journey of life. There's beauty and pain if you can feel deep enough into it. Because pain is the cellular memory of emotional density and inflammation breaking apart within you to make space for more light to be embodied. Would you repeat that? <laughs> I'll do my best. Pain is cellular debris, which is unprocessed emotion, and physical inflammation breaking apart within you to make space for more light to be embodied. I remember once I was in a deep state of pain, and one of my friends, beautiful invitation, said, I'd love to help you out of that pain. I said, no thanks, I've earned this. I've earned this pain. And they had no idea what I was talking about. You've earned this pain, yes. I've earned the right to be fully present with how fast I'm evolving. Let it break apart, let it rip apart. No mercy for me. No mercy. If I need to be broken in half and busted apart for more God consciousness to be embodied, well, I guess that's the game we're playing. That's how I live. And I'm not always in pain. But when I am, game on. Take a moment and tune into your experience and ask yourself this question. Where is the beauty or innocence in you that you have not recognized as often as you should? 
Where is the beauty or innocence in you that is waiting to be recognized right now? Let me give you a little assistance if, if the question doesn't give an answer. The innocence and beauty that is here to be recognized is the opportunity for you to find beauty in the imperfections you hide from others. What are the imperfections you hide from others? What are the imperfections that when they arise, you pull away from others and you go, let me go in my private little inner sanctuary, fix my imperfections and come back out perfectly. The beauty that needs to be recognized are the perfections, that, the imperfections that you don't want anyone else to see. It's okay to have imperfections. I'm not afraid of them. What's your imperfection? Maybe it's you want love so deeply, but you're so afraid to receive it. Maybe you're so ready, willing, and able to give the love of your heart to another person that it comes from a space of desperation. That it makes someone feel overwhelmed instead of uplifted. What's your imperfection? That recognizing someone else's passions, talents, and abilities innocently causes you to look at what's less than in you by comparison. Where's the imperfection? The innocent tendency to make everything your fault? Where's the imperfection? Can we find beauty in the innocence of our deepest imperfections? What are the things that you hide from others that you're afraid will be deemed as unlovable? What are the things you hide from others that you think if I bring that to the table, they're going to leave me and never talk to me ever again? The things that you have called your inner ugliness. The things you tuck away in the closet. As if your heart is a home, a freshly renovated home, but the imperfection is the unfinished basement you don't want anyone to see. Oh, no, no, don't go down there. Don't go down there. No, no, just stay up on the main floor where it's open concept. <laughs> notice, notice the subway tile on the backsplash. Look how beautiful that is. Notice the archways. Sub-zero fridge, check that out. Oh, that, oh, that door downstairs? No, 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 we don't need to go down there. It's unfinished. We don't need to go to the unfinished. It's gonna take away from the beauty of the upstairs. Do you see that metaphor? You're afraid that your imperfections will take away from what in you is already refined, aligned, and perfect. And you see, spiritual alignment is when we allow the imperfections and ugliness of, of those edges that we're still buffing out to be embraced by the perfection of our unconditional love. Let what's perfect in you embrace what is imperfect so you're not hiding from those that are only here to love you. Not hiding from a world that is only here to welcome you. And do me one big favor. Do not try to, do not try to push down your imperfections and build a spiritual character on top of it. Because this real spiritual journey is about pulling up the floorboards, finding those imperfections, and embracing it with the love that it's always desired. Take a moment and tune in to yourself. 
what in you wants to be loved that you've been saying not until you've become better? How have you been playing out your own family conditioning and your own consciousness? Not now, honey, you haven't earned it. You haven't run my spiritual gauntlet and won the gold medal yet. What needs your love? Is it your mind? Is it your ego? Is it, your, is it reactions? Is it judgments? Nothing's off the table. Are they prejudices? Biases? Maybe not towards others, towards yourself. Here's another, again, I ask questions to get from different angles. Is there any which way in which you, in some way, are your worst enemy? Where are you an enemy versus an ally to yourself? What do you need to do to cause you to turn away from you? That's the part that needs to be loved. And you don't have to jump to loving the things you despise about yourself. I'm just saying let's open up that the things we despise about ourselves or the most embarrassed about ourselves are, is only here to be loved. You don't have to jump to loving it quite yet. Maybe just let's round the corner to this is here to be loved. And I can, I can continue judging it. Go from healer to healer as if it's like a child who won't act appropriately and you just keep throwing it into the arms of another child psychologist. Here, you fix it. There's nothing wrong with healing modalities, but let me be very clear with you. There's no amount of Reiki that will change what love can do. Love, not how inappropriate things can be in you, but love, that there's something inappropriate in you that is going to only relent until, you, or that won't relent until you love it. Here's the game. There are aspects of your shadow that have never been loved and recognized by others because their behavior was seen as unworthy of validation. Because from your family's point of view, to validate that behavior is to say it's okay to act that way. So you were, treat, you were conditioned to learn what's right and wrong, and so then it came in a way that made you feel as if you're capable of being punished if you, do, if you do something out of line. So here's the game of rectifying that. Your inner shadow gets the say and do, and I don't mean in terms of outside of yourself. I don't mean to give yourself permission to do things that harm yourself or abuse yourself or do self-destructive tendencies or abuse things or be ad, you know, have addictive behavior. I'm saying just inside your own consciousness, your shadow gets to say and think whatever it wants. And you get to support it and love it no matter what it says. And even on the outside, if it says, give me this, and you know it's not good for you, I'm sorry, honey, I can't. Well, if not, I'm gonna just get mean and ruthless and nasty. Go for it, I love you. That's when we go into what's called the final battle, which is the final war. And the war is the shadow fights the thing that keeps it from getting its way, and we love the shadow to death. Like a child that's having a tantrum because you're not giving it breakfast cereal for dinner. Say, honey, if I do that, you're gonna be up all night crazy. Can't do it and your child's on the floor. You ever seen children when they're having the tantrum? I don't know why they go to this thing where they go on the floor and then they're swimming. You ever seen that? <laughs> or doing the snow angel on the floor? You ever seen that? <laughs> what are they permanently marking the space where they realize they hated you? What are they doing? <laughs> 
but your shadow is like a child who was just furiously expressing the vengeance of not getting their way because they never got unconditional love. So they learned that the seeking of objects, food for emotional comfort, maybe the high of a drug is the replacement, alcohol, whatever it is. And you're not giving it its replacement for love because you're actually just giving it love itself. And it doesn't know how to receive that. So the battle is the shadow surrendering to the light. And it's our job to be the light that finds the shadow and says, honey, it's okay that you think that. It's okay that you want that. It's okay that you fear that. It's okay that you think that. It's okay that you worry about that. It's okay that you judge that. I'm just gonna respond with, I hear you. Thank you for sharing what's important to you with me. And I love you. Authentically and graciously, I love you. And even if loving it causes it to attack you verbally and mentally, because it's reflecting to you that when I was loved by someone else, those are the people that attacked me too. I opened up to their love and then I was a sitting duck. They're just showing you their pain. Honey, I understand and I love you for showing me this. I love you. Love outsmarts the shadow every single time when you're truly aligned in the authenticity of it. I love you. Where in your body does it feel like the shadow of unconsciousness lurks? The ugliness that you don't want anyone to see. Is it in your body? Is it in your mind? Where is it? Is it in the background? Is it in the background like something following you around and you're afraid to let it step forward and take you over? I love you. Find it. I love you. And say, I love you. I love you. I love you. The shadow is the appearance of misery just waiting to be freed from its own inner ugliness when you recognize that only beauty resides in any form. I love you. 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 Can we be the most elegant and graceful with the parts of us that are the most harsh? When those parts get harsh, we get soft. When, et, when the hardened edges arise within you, we just create softness and elegance around it. We give your harshest shadow the softest place to land. I love you. 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 And we're going to do a little bit of a meditation to help us deepen this. Some of us are already having releases, and you're safe to. Face and set free what only wants tenderness. So in this meditation, which I've never done before, so this will be fun. This meditation has a, has a very simple instruction. We're just gonna sit and I'm gonna give us some space for the meditation and I'm gonna guide you here and there. But give space for your direct experience. Not only to process all that I shared, but this meditation is gonna start with a very simple instruction. And the meditation is, let's just sit. And the only invitation is, how soft and tender can you be with you? How much time in the day do you take to ever stop and just be soft and tender with nothing but you? You may not. So, let's take this moment and make this you time. 
The only invitation for this meditation, no, no spiritual fancy dance, no visualizing anything, no leaving your body and going off into the higher realms. Be in your body, and the, and the question that we contemplate viscerally is how soft and tender can you be with yourself right now? Even if things are arising and you say very softly on the inside, it's okay, honey, it's okay. And if you can't quite go there, then the things I say will be speaking on your behalf, it's okay. It's okay, sweet one, I love you. You're totally safe to feel that way. Thank you for trusting me with your deepest, darkest. Thank you for bringing your ugliness out to be shared with me, thank you. I'm only gonna see it as beauty and you're safe to share it. You're only sharing with me the way other people have judged you. Thank you for sharing that with me. How soft and tender can you be? Relax your body. Do not fall asleep. Just be totally attentive in being as soft and tender as possible. Soft and tender is the way we surrender. Soft and tender is the way we surrender. Someone asked, asked me, how do we surrender? I said, softly and tenderly. Where is there tightness in your body? Relax it, please. Is it your neck and your shoulders? Soft and tender is the way we surrender. You're safe to feel. It's okay. 